folks that need to get into this room. So um, uh, welcome to everybody. You've probably gotten a little message on there. We're recording this and we are also sharing it on YouTube and HowlRound. Uh, and we are also captioning it. So hopefully that will work for everybody. Um, I wanted to say uh, welcome to you all to this. Uh, we've got a great group of folks that want to share some of the things that they've been doing. Uh, I guess a special also mahalo nui loa to the folks in Honolulu for traveling the longest distance here uh, from us. So it is way early in the morning. They're going to go a little later in the show order or the speaking order just so they can let the caffeine kick in. Um, so there's a lot of conversations going on right now, right, about what theater is or isn't, and does it really have to be this binary of one thing or the other? Um, on one hand, with all of the digital work, uh, it's great that folks are able to give access to large number of people, uh, not only in this country, but internationally. Uh, it's great that uh, theaters and other institutions have been opening up their archives so we could see work that we wouldn't normally be able to. Um, I think with the digital form, it's still, we still are able to feel uh, emotion and we are able to feel empathy, but just in a different kind of way. Um, so I uh, wanted to have us explore that, the flow of what will happen in this session today, if you're not uh, familiar with the Pecha Kucha, um, that we've lined up uh, seven different groups to talk about their projects. They'll have uh, approximately six minutes to be talking. We will be timing. Um, and so after they go through, if you've got questions for any of them, please put it in the chat box. And one of our staff, one of our team here will be scanning the chat box and also the YouTube chat for uh, questions there. Then after folks have talked about their projects, we'll do a little Q&A. Uh, then we're going to a break for about five minutes. Uh, and then I'd love to invite you to do, um, to, to join us into breakout rooms. And there's a lot of us, so we'll have a lot of breakout groups. Ideally, we'll have about seven folks uh, in each of the rooms and we'll try to distribute our speakers uh, around those different rooms. And uh, whatever you would like to talk about, certainly, but the biggest thing in my head is, um, why does theater have to be a binary definition? What is theater, what isn't it, what can it be? Um, particularly as we move forward. Then we'll come back from the breakouts. We'll do a little popcorn um, sharing as much as we can. We'll use the raise hand function for that and um, we'll talk you through that. And then um, if for whatever reason we don't go the full hour, uh, two hours, then um, I don't think anybody would object to having some of your time back, right? Um, so if we're all good to go, my friends, um, I'm turning it over to um, our first up, our folks from La Mama. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Billy Clark and I'm the artistic director of Culture Hub, the art and technology center based at La Mama. Um, and um, I'm also here with uh, Mia Yu and uh, Nikki Parizo and Chris Ignacio somewhere out there. Uh, and um, so they might uh, jump in. I encourage uh, uh, them to jump in uh, at any moment if they have something um, to add. Um, uh, I, we have uh, two videos uh, that we would like to share with you uh, in advance. That'll be about uh, three minutes and, um, and then I'll, I'll speak after them. Uh, but just to give a, a brief introduction to what those are showing. Uh, one is just a, a general overview of uh, a quick trailer of the work we've been doing over the past 10 years of, uh, uh, the, uh, with Culture Hub uh, in collaboration with La Mama uh, and the Soul Institute of the Arts, our other co-founder. And, and the uh, second video is um, uh, just excerpts from uh, a project that we've started only since uh, social distancing has been put in place, which is called Downtown Variety. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, after the videos. So thanks, Josh, if you could play those, that would be great.
There's no one else in your house? Are you alone? You've got someone there. As we wait for the day when things can return to normal, to the way things were, I don't want to go back to that normal. Even more than herd immunity, I am looking for immunity from this herd. You heard hummingbird? I want to fly from flower to flower and freeze to admire her beauty. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me see, I think I have a minute or so uh, left. I, I just want to um, uh, talk a little bit about um, what Culture Hub is, and, we, and, and, and it relates very much to the, the topic of today. We, uh, 10 years ago, we, we formed Culture Hub in collaboration with La Mama and the Soul Institute of the Arts to really explore how we could use um, the internet and video conferencing technology in particular uh, to make a connection between these two long-standing collaborators that had been working together for over uh, 30 years. And um, so from the very, very beginning, um, we were uh, investigating what it meant to, to use um, live video and audio feeds um, and uh, video conferencing hardware and software uh, in the context of um, live performance and, and in conjunction with the performing arts. and. Um, we ran into a lot of uh, issues along the way, uh, many things that were roadblocks uh, to that work. Um, we were always interested in this idea of uh, um, really layering these technologies on real physical spaces so that we could uh, uh, not only uh, connect as individuals, but we could also convene uh, um, uh, audiences and um, uh, and larger groups of people and, and bring those communities together and cross pollinate those communities. So we were looking um, uh, how this these uh, technologies could be used in a variety of different formats, uh, you know, including education and distance learning, but also uh, right from the beginning, very forward thinking in terms of what were the implications in terms of developing collaborative creative projects uh, in this space. Um, we rapidly discovered that we had so many connections in the performing arts world, but we didn't have that many in the media arts and technology space. And so we worked very hard in the first five years of Culture Hub to sort of uh, expand that network and to create those relationships. And about um, five years ago, one of the uh, initiatives that we, um, we took on was um, uh, in, in frustration with, with the tools that were available to us was to start developing our own uh, software tool for the kind of work and for creative artists and producers that were trying to uh, make work in this space. Um, and some of the, the, the challenges that we were facing were cost, difficulty of impl uh, implementation, um, and, and so finally um, we're at a point where we're going to be releasing um, uh, Live Lab, which is the software that we've developed over the past five years. It's ready uh, and it's available for people uh, to use. Um, and it's what we've been using to produce Downtown Variety, which is um, uh, over the past, um, in response to the social distancing with um, COVID-19, uh, we, um, uh, in collaboration with the, the whole La Mama team, uh, decided that we wanted to create a, a variety show, a weekly variety show that would be online uh, that is used Live Lab uh, as the infrastructure to, to produce that and stream it out in collaboration with HowlRound. Um, 
So uh, I'd love uh, to uh, share more about that. If you're interested in that, um, I'm happy to talk about it in a breakout, um, or you can also reach us at culturehub.org. Uh, and there's also a mailing list for that on uh, culturehub.org uh, slash uh, backslash uh, live lab. Um, if you um, want to sign up for the mailing list there to, to get more information. And cool. I think I must be at my time, right? You're a little over. There's okay. some grace time in there. <laughs> Thank you. So It's all good. <laughs> I actually wanted to give that space because La Mama has really been the pioneer in so much of this work. And so many people have been inspired and been riffing off of the work that you've been doing. So thank you all. Uh, thank we're going to move. Yeah, we're going to move over to our friends at the Movement Theater Company. Hi, folks. And uh, Josh, I'll cue you in to start the slides. Um, uh, my name is Deidre Harrington. I'm one of the producing artistic leaders at the Movement Theater Company, and I'm joined with uh, David Mendezabel, one of my fellow uh, producing artistic leaders, as well as costume and scenic designer Clint Ramos, who is one of our curators on One Move. Um, so I'll start by just giving you a little bit of information about the movement. We're a Harlem-based theater company that's dedicated to developing and producing new work by artists of color, really getting, giving artists of color and opportunity <clears throat> to explore um, uh, aesthetic and form and really dream big um, and, and have that opportunity to experiment that so many artists of color um, so seldom get uh, to do. Um, we've been doing a couple of things since uh, COVID started. Uh, one thing that we've done, um, especially in light of uh, the recent murders of Black folks, um, we've reached out to Alicia Harris and Whitney White um, Alicia, who was the uh, writer, and uh, Whitney, uh, the director of What to Send Up When It Goes Down, which we produced back in 2018, um, and reached out to them to partner with them to create uh, what we're calling um, Resilience, which uh, is, there's going to be a, a video that's released that is a meditation on, on what uh, Black folks are, how we're moving through this moment. Um, and then we've also launched an Instagram called Love Letters for Black People, which is where we are posting um, uh, all of the love letters that we've received um, and that we've gathered through the many productions and presentations of the show, um, just as a way to provide some positivity to start populating on our feeds and some strength and encouragement as we're going through this time. Um, and uh, One Move uh, is, is a program that we started back in 2016 um, in response to that election. And knowing that theater takes so long for us to develop and produce and raise the funds, and we wanted to create a platform, a digital platform, for our artists to respond to things that are happening in the now. And so uh, that's what One Move is about. And then I'm going to pass it on to David, um, who's going to talk specifically about One Move designed by. And Josh, if you'll go ahead and start those slides, that'd be great. Thanks, Deidre. Um, so One Move designed by, uh, we, we were fortunate to be a grantee of uh, Art Equity, the Arts and uh, Artists and Activists uh, Fund. And so with that money, we really were examining who are uh, folks in our field that are not uh, uh, receiving support um, right now, especially as the theater as we've known it has uh, gone away. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we are very close friends with Clint Ramos and Chasi, and we were noticing a lot of advocacy for designers. And one of the things that we're really excited by is the visual world of theater and how designers help us shape that visual world. So we reached out to them to help us curate a commission series called One Move Design By, which is a designer driven initiative where the designer acts with the absolute freedom as the lead artist to create digital content. Um, and that is uh, in the form of two to five minute videos um, and the virtual gallery, which will be on our website, is going to be launched on Monday. And the hope of this is to continue to um, showcase the work of these emerging designers who help us bring the worlds that we see on our stages to life in a digital space. Um, and Clint can talk a little bit more about our um, uh, curation process. Yeah. Hi, um, so uh, 
Um, thank you, David. Uh, so we, what we asked each designer um, was to actually create work around the idea of the pandemic, right? So, so the work really varied from sort of like what could be perceived as a meditation on the on the zeitgeist or various implications that it could be. We've sort of encouraged them to be their own kind of auteurs, you know, something a designer, uh, usually a designer in the theater is not allowed to do. So, you know, we asked them to create work that was thematically direct or tangential to the present thing. It could be political or apolitical. It could be a psychological exploration of mortality or an expression of a future joy, um, a form of immigration protest or conceptual peace based on a personal fear. Um, so a lot of these, um, as you can see, a lot of these designers really dug deep, you know, and so I think part of this exercise was to sort of um, deconstruct Construct what uh, what a theater design is and what a theater designer's process is, and sort of really look at what those parameters are. And you know, I think what we're trying to do here is recreate that sense of community, uh, create a tangible creation that, by its DNA, you know, just by the virtue of who's creating it, is inherently a product of theatrical thinking. So as you can look at all of the, the designer's work, which is like really varied, um, it produces work that I think, you know, is extraordinary, but it's also unique to a theater designer. Um, and I just want to say, lastly, a lot of this, um, and, and I have to say thank you to the Movement Theater Company, was a response to the dearth of resources that designers actually have in the American theater. Uh, the desi designers rarely get grants, you know, uh, designers are not covered with a lot of the fellowships, you know, so uh, uh, designers alone actually sort of suffer from a dearth of resources. Um, but specifically, you know, immigrant designers right now are under siege because by not being able to work, their statuses in America is actually threatened. You know, um, uh, they cannot apply for any federal or state resources because that would make them uh, uh, wards of the state, which is illegal. But they also have to maintain a body of work. They need to be constantly working um, because if they have a lapse of three months where they're not working, that is a ground for deportability. So. I encourage all of you to sort of reach out to all of these emerging young designers of color and immigrant designers and see what kind of work you can commission them to do. Great. Thank you so much, folks. Um, so uh, I think Josh is going to transition and we're going to transition. Uh, we're going to go to Juggernaut, uh, Juggernaut and Pop Up Theatrics. Hi, everybody. My name is Tamala Woodard. I am uh, one of the founders of Pop Up um, Theatrics, and I'm here today with um, my, my co founder, Anna Majananu, and with the Juggernaut family, um, uh, Natasha and Tanya. Bravo, who have been our partners in this last um, uh, venture <laughs> called Long Distance Affair. And we want to just talk to you about um, a particular um, enterprise that we completed only last week. Um, first of all, just to, just to say a little bit about the company. Um, Okay, a little bit about the company pop up. Um, we were started in 2011. Um, and it, we the company's values are about creating uh, collaborative experiences for artists uh, uh, without um, thinking about borders. Um, those are those are um, national borders, racial borders, cultural borders, all of the things that um, separate us in terms of our ideology, our experience, and to think about how to bring people together into dynamic um, and challenging um, art making experiences. Um, participation for our audience, creating means of participation that unritualize the theater, that make an audience um, understand the value of their presence there. In fact, that it cannot happen without them. We have a lot of one-on-one -on -one experiences so that the idea that if you're not here, it's not happening is really, really profoundly true in all of our work. And then the last thing is immersion. And how do we create an experience for an audience that is 360 degrees, that wraps around the audience themselves and that creates a different level of proximity for them to the work. All of this is all an effort to help um, create a, a new audience for the theater that understands that they're needed in order for the theater to survive. 
So LDA, long distance affair, was a concept actually like that um, came out of my partner Anna Majananu's mind, and she'll tell you more um, particularly about it. But we started this in 2013. And the concept was to bring together international art artists in a collaboration that happened 100% online. The platform we used then was Skype. Remember Skype, y'all? <laughs> 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 um, and the three, the teams, the director, the playwrights, um, and the actors were, we put, we put people together that we gathered from literally six continents, um, asked them to interrogate each other's lives, to look at the, um, the performer space, to think of that space as site specific and to create and write particularly for that space, for the time, for the location and for the actor, um, and to create an Fair, that an audience would then join them also by using this platform, um, then called Skype and now called Zoom, um, and meet a character on the other side of the world that they would have no other access to otherwise because they'd have to like get on a plane. So when this whole thing happened, of course, we got a lot of emails from people around the world who had been artists. We've uh, collaborated with more than 100 artists at this point literally on six continents um, that said we should bring this forward um, to now. And so we created the sixth iteration um, of Long Distance Affair and modified it a small amount. One, we put it on Zoom. The other, um, the audience used to have to come to a place and sit at terminals in little boxes in little um, designed rooms um, and have their affair. And now we open that to them to actually do in their houses, on their couches, at their kitchen tables, at their desks. and um, have have a direct conversation that's one-on-one -on -one with a character in Madrid or Singapore or Philadelphia or um, uh, Bucharest um, or Miami, um, or to have a conversation with a character and four other humans who have logged on um, to, that, um, to that encounter. Uh, uh, Juggernaut will say a little bit about all of the feedback we've gotten from audiences. We wanted to create a space where people could encounter um, their loneliness and they could encounter other people who were also in isolation and that we could tell each other's stories that hopefully would be healing and would be um, um, the kinds of stories that folks felt like they needed to hear right now, which was about resiliency and uh, overcoming. So that's a little about LDA. Uh, in general, and Anna will say uh, a little more about this particular one. Uh, but first, we will watch a little video, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> should tell you all the bad stuff uh, about myself first. If you can dream it, you can be it. I mean, there are 36 windows out here. I can only, I only wash her. Oh, that is great parents. Oh my God. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ana Marginano and I am uh, another part of Pop Up. Uh, so to me, one of the things that uh, makes LDA really special is the audience interactions, the audience participation. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that we kept uh, uh, our performance for such a small audience is some of the shows are meant for one person at a time, while others are for a maximum audience of five. So everyone is greeted by name as they arrive at the, uh, at the station. People are encouraged to unmute their microphones. People are encouraged to um, turn their cameras on. Uh, people are constantly reminded that um, in a friendly way that they are actually there and that they are very important to us, that they are 
co-creating this performance. They're really part of it. So basically, um, uh, the uh, um, actors would would uh, see the reaction and something would change in their attitude or they would say something about um, the way the audience is holding their hand. Um, they would be able to move, to participate to the story um, as much as they wish. Like uh, they, they can basically um, uh, be quiet and that's also super okay, but they can be as much involved as they want to. And I feel that uh, we, we kept saying our um, actors and our playwrights, so let's not compete with Netflix. <laughs> and I feel this was our, this is our way of not competing with Netflix, basically uh, letting people know within the performance and that performance is not necessarily realistic. We had uh, angels, we have uh, uh, all sorts of camera movements. So, um, uh, so it's not like this type of um, very realistic Zoom call. But in the same time, uh, the audience knows that uh, they are seen and that their presence and participation um, matters. I'm so, going to jump in, Anna, please. because we have time for you all. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to pick up more of that in the breakouts, and there'll be a little bit of time after, but uh, I wanted to be able to shift this, okay? Just in the Pecha Kucha. Um, so uh, next up is Theater Move. Thanks, Amelia. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. I'm Lily Tung Crystal, the Artistic Director at Theater Moo, and we're the second largest Asian American theater company in the country, located in the Twin Cities, and we've been around for 27 years. Um, since the murder of George Floyd, we are, the mom are for the moment not, no longer doing online programming because our staff is now activated in our, in our neighborhoods, taking care of our BIPOC communities. Um, but before last week, um, starting March 16th, we implemented three virtual shows a week, both artistic programming as well as theater related programming. And it's really changed the impact of, it's really changed the impact we're making. As you all know, theater is a local construct and with the global virtual world, we've been able to build Asian American community and theater community across the world. Um, uh, Josh, could you pull up my first photo? So this first photo is of Moo Mondays, which is one of the events we have. It's a space where Asian American artists gather to read plays by Asian American playwrights. And we've had everywhere from 20 people on the, on the Zoom to 60 people. And it's become a safe healing space where um, Asian American artists can connect and, do, and, and work on their craft and learn more about Asian American plays and um, discuss those plays in a safe space. And then our next photo, uh, what we do on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. is a show called Family Explorations, where we hire an artist to um, teach families a theater-related activity. And that gives us the chance to employ our artists. And actually, all the artists that appear on our shows are paid, um, with the exception of Moon Mondays, because that's an inward-facing event. And then our next uh, photo is um, is from Mutini Hour, which has become our flagship show. It happens every Friday night at seven o'clock and it happens on Zoom and then streamed to Facebook Live. It started with a company um, hangout uh, with Interstate, which is a show written by Melissa Lee and Kit Yen that I was in at Mixed Blood and we closed early. And so we got everybody together as a virtual online hangout um, that was live. And we got such great feedback and there was so much support for it that we decided to continue Mutini Hour every, hour every Friday um, as a space for fun, but also for a forum to talk about important issues. And our next photo is our Mutini Hour from racism. We had the racism as a virus um, leaders there, Diane Phelan and um, Ariel Estrada with actor Brian Kim. And we've had people on like Lauren Yee, David Honey Huang, Leanna Naka Winkler, and as you can see here on the right side, um, even if for the people in our communities that aren't on the Zoom, the chat has provided this Im immense um, opportunity for them to be in community with each other. And so that has been a great 
um, boon for our community and people have been donating because of this work and also um, in, in community with each other, which has been a, a real gift. And um, that culminated to the next, the next photo is of our um, Mutiny Hour with George Takei, Leia Salonga, and Jay Kuo, which reached, um, we had 110,000 views. And I joke that it, more people saw, more views <laughs> happened that one night than people would see our shows in five years. It was, <laughs> so it, that was a big sign to us of the global impact we're making. We had people come in from Philippines, China, Australia, all over the US because of George's immense social media reach. And um, again, it opened the doors to donations, to sponsorship of the program. And what I like to do at every Mutini Hour, even though it's not artistic programming, it's theater related, I do feel like the programming needs to be as interesting or entertaining as theater. And so I try to implement fun activities in the Mutini Hour, like games or, or um, the Proust questionnaire. And in this instance, we uh, made a cake for George's birthday and presented him with the transponder cake um, <clears throat> that night. And then another thing we did which is the video, and you can pause it for now, um, Josh, and then we can play it. Um, th it's, we, we implemented, or we organized, Amelia Cachapero came on with Phil Congo Tonda and Snehal Desai to talk about um, the origins of Asian American theater. And we organized a surprise reunion for Philip and Amelia with the OGs from that era, from the 70s and 80s. And um, I told Amelia that we, we had a surprise for her, and this is what happened next. Hold Maybe on. Maybe I need a drink refill for this. Do you want to go get a drink refill? You're welcome. I'm going to be right back. Okay. <laughs> Lily, can we like come it. up here? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Wow. Holy <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> This is great. <laughs> It's okay. Sorry. I've been watching. Oh my God. And thank you so much. So, I want to know what's going on. Wait, oh, right. oh, 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 oh. so, so, okay, I want to introduce to our audience who's in the room. So, oh my God. these are all people who have worked together before and who are the Okay, so, um, so that was in the middle of Asian American Pacific Heritage Month. That was a really big, fun thing for us to do, and it, there was a lot of love in the room. And, um, and at the, at, near the end of Asian American Heritage Month, we, we felt like we wanted to do more artistic programming. And so the next photo, Josh, is a, a variety show that we organized with dance, music, spoken word, and comedy artists in the Twin Cities primarily. And you can just scroll through the next two photos, Josh. And um, we introduced our Mellon Foundation playwright in residence, I moved to Vangse, she co-hosted. And there were, um, th these are some photos from the variety show. So this was our first artistic programming since we, we couldn't gather anymore. And then the final photo is um, this last week we were, we were scheduled to do a play fest gathering 30 Asian American theater artists. And you can see who they are there. Um, 30 Asian American theater artists to come together to create six 10 minute plays for the virtual environment. And it was supposed to happen Friday and Saturday. And because of the trauma and pain going on here in the Twin Cities, we chose to cancel that event. And um, our mission is to amplify unheard voices. And part of that mission is to know when to step aside to let others speak. And now, our, like I said, our staff is activated on the ground here, taking care of our communities. Moon Mondays has shifted into a caretaking and nurturing space for our artists to gather. And um, because of our increased reach we've experienced over the last two and a half months, we are talking about restarting Mutini Hour to become a place for more conversations focused on social activism at this time. And eventually, when we do gather again in the theater, we're hoping that we still continue some of this online programming. Like Amelia said, it doesn't have to be binary. We, we'd like to still continue Moon Mondays to gather our artists from around the country to read plays. And we also would like to continue Mutini Hour, just not, probably not on a weekly basis. And so that is, um, but it's really taught us that we can use this space to support and employ our artists and also to um, increase our impact globally and, and build Asian American community globally. Great, thanks so much, Lily. And for everybody watching, that was not a paid announcement. <laughs> it was public embarrassment, but okay. 
Um, <laughs> so, Amelia, you were so great on that show. <laughs> Um, thanks, Lily. Uh, we're going to shift actually over to Lisa Portes, please. Hi, everybody. How are you? I, I just feel like a, a little shrimp among giants here. Um, I had the MFA. Uh, my name is Lisa Portes. Uh, she or hers. I had the MFA directing program at the theater school at DePaul University in Chicago. And, uh, on, and I'm here really representing my graduate directors. On Thursday, March 12th, uh, we were told that all of the, uh, our productions, our spring productions were canceled. Boop, canceled. Uh, and by the next morning, each of my directors uh, had a new path forward um, based on a challenge uh, that we, uh, that we uh, kind of threw down, uh, which was, what is the dream of this production? Why, is this, why was this production something that you wanted to create? And how can you and your team create this that uh, in another platform. And literally Friday morning, we had six new ideas. So I'm gonna share my screen and please forgive me. I get very nervous with technology and I hope nothing weird shows up. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna take you through some things. So, um, oh, share, oh, this makes me so panicky. Okay. Uh, so let me full screen this. The first thing that was created was down in Mississippi. Uh, the play had been a, a, was going to be a studio, which means a kind of small classroom production directed by MFA one director, Emil Thomas, who turned down in Mississippi by Carlisle Brown with permission from Carlisle Brown into a live zoom reading. Uh, and so when you entered, you saw this screen, you heard, I hope you can hear this music. It was a live radio play featuring historic visuals. The program was up front. You could see the actors. Okay, I'm going to move past that because that'll be up for a little bit. There's Emil, the Southern gentleman with a New York attitude. The next screen would probably be our dramaturgy slide, providing context about the Summer of Freedom. And then you'll see, I'm not gonna play you the play, but I am gonna take you to what he meant by what Mamil was working to create historic, historic. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't call me Miss Ellen. Let me know what that means, like Miss Anne or Master or Boss, stuff like that. Okay, so the actors are acting, uh, the actors are acting uh, just using their audio and then a series of images, uh, um, Emil and his team put together a series of images from the period that in some way um, reflected or created a conversation and relationship to the scene. So that was down in Mississippi turned into a live Zoom reading with uh, uh, historic visuals. Um, the next thing that came up was Boxed In by director Stephanie Bolt, MFA2. She was working with a playwright on a play that was meant to go into rehearsal and go into production. It was a brand new play, would have been a world premiere. And when, uh, the, when we couldn't do production, they turned it into an online experience. This is a piece based on the parents of Ted Bundy. Um, and really looking at um, uh, kind of the mother of monsters mythology. And at each piece, it's put together kind of as a curated. So at each level, when you click on an object, you might hear something. It's organized by year. I don't know if I can click out of this. I think I can click out of this. Uh, so this is 1946 to 1957. And you can get, you just keep diving deeper. This was Ted Bundy's closet, deeper and deeper. Um, uh, what was really exciting about this is it really does, it takes a theater experience and then moves it into an online platform that really functions like an online platform. What do we do online? We click around and we find things out and we kind of dive down rabbit holes. Um, the third project I'd like to bring to you is Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Um, originally, this was supposed to be a production. It was uh, uh, MFA3 director Ben Ra'anan's uh, thesis project. 
uh, you can't imagine the heartbreak of a student finding out their thesis project that they've built their entire three years towards is canceled, particularly this project for Ben, who is an advocate for uh, the disability community and the neuro, uh, uh, the, the differently um, abled community. Uh, uh, and what he, he and his ensemble did, which was really beautiful, was in answer to the question, how can you make what you were going to make in a different way. They said, well, we don't want to do the play, and also we can't do the play for rights reasons. Instead, they created an online resource for people with autism, um, an arts resource for people with autism, or really anybody who needs calm in this moment. And you'll see that under each of these, uh, there are meditations. There are, this is based on um, Bob, uh, Bob Roth. Uh, you can watch somebody color. You can watch somebody play guitar. The Hunter Heartbeats series by, um, uh, oh, Ben, don't get mad at me, Kelly Hunter. Uh, and this really is, you can click around this, and as well as honoring the original production. So you can see what was originally going to happen and then what they ultimately created. Uh, series, uh, yes, okay, great. And um, I was working with a playwright, uh, Maddie, Del, uh, Maddie Dopalt, oh, and her play, The Model Play which was turned into an on which we turned into an online uh, website and podcast which is housed uh, here. I'm just going to take you through just a little bit of it. Come on fly fly. Just be careful. No. The models uh, this is this follows five 16 year old models in the year 1987 to 1988 as they travel the world. You would listen to the podcast here. You can see what they're wearing here. Uh, there is a complete with a, uh, oh, where is it? Oh yes, complete with a BuzzFeed quiz, find out what model you are. And then finally, um, one of the directors doing lemons, 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 created an Instagram uh, play where they received the rights from the director, I mean, from the playwright, excuse me, to turn it into an Instagram project. Um, I can't find my other beautiful Instagram picture because I'm not as organized as Josh. But mainly what I wanted to point out, and I'm gonna get out of the share screen, is that it was a tremendous time of innovation um, and it will continue to be a tremendous time of innovation as we ask ourselves, what were we trying to make and how can we use the tools available to us to reinvent what theater is at that time in the time of the COVID and at this time in this time of actual revolution? What is theater? Who is it for? What is the cry of the project that you're trying to create and how do you create it using the resources available to you? Thank you, Lisa. Those are exactly the questions that should be forefront in our minds. And I am so inspired by the work of these students. Amazing. We're going to see more um, student work because we're going to shift to Peter Quo. Um, hi. Oh, are you all seeing something? No. Yes. Now. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, hi, I have a lot I want to share, so I'm going to talk really quickly. Um, so I uh, directed the MFA production of In Love and Warcraft for ACT, where I'm the Associate Conservatory Director, where I uh, do administrative work, direct, and teach. Um, but before I talk about my theater life, uh, I've worked in the theater for about 22 years, but for a stint of period, I was working on online digital medium. Um, so, I don't know if that happened. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for four years, uh, I was making YouTube video sketch comedies in which I was talking to myself. You can see a sample of me talk, singing happy birthday to myself. Uh, at the peak, I had about 5,000 subscribers, and uh, which this was an audience that I cultivated and developed and worked with really closely. Um, basically, because of that audience, when I would upload a video within 24 hours, I would get about 1.5 thousand views on those videos. Um, so as much as I really loved the community and audience that I had built through YouTube, uh, the key community that was built was uh, fellow YouTubers. So co other content creators, these were people who would create content, um, we'd share it, we'd watch it, we'd give each other feedback and critique. Um, this is to me just about the fact that we 
created online digital community. We were really close friends. Uh, we hung out late into the night. And by hanging out, some of it was playing games, some of it was chatting, and some of it was literally just being sharing digital space while we were doing laundry, cooking, um, not even talking to each other, but just sharing space. Um, so these were my inter friends. Um, we uh, hung out a lot and there was uh, we spanned across the United States and to also uh, the United Kingdom and also had people coming in and out of our friend group throughout the entire globe. Um, eventually this uh, URL relationship turned into IRL relationships. Uh, when we had VidCon, which was YouTube's video conference, we would all get together and that's when we would meet and it was uh, such a delightful way to get to know each other. Um, but we also still stayed in contact um, both online and past. Um, so several of these friends I still hang out with. Um, we go, we meet together once a year, either in London or they come here or we'll go to Vegas. Um, there's a picture of us all wearing our outfits uh, as we head into a RAV4 heading to Vegas one day. Um, Axel is a friend who I met through YouTube, who is uh, was is a writer at Victory Gardens. Um, he was also, I think, I believe at Northwestern um, and featured recently in TCG's uh, Spotlight, people, uh, people to watch. Um, we met 10 years ago on YouTube. Um, um, and so one of the interesting things uh, I say is just intimate, close, deep relationships can be formed online through screens. And I just want people to know that. And it can occur between artists and it can occur between audiences. So how does it translate to live video theater? Um, this MFA production I directed was for In Loving Warcraft uh, by Madhuri Shaker. Um, so I just want to show a clip. What? Go to her dorm. What? Go to her dorm room now. Tell her the teacher I wrote to you word for word. I don't remember. Bluetooth it. Bluetooth now. Battle resing mold drock. Boss going into phase two in three, two, chai. What the hell are you doing? You know what? This game is stupid. <laughs> chai, I know you're hurting, but we don't have to speak to the school, okay? Baby, please, just hear me out. I, 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 I ow! Um, so, uh, as you can see, these were four different students. Those are students of six, and four of them, or all six of them were in independent homes. None of them were together. So, uh, they shared space by uh, acting like they were together. Um, this is... <laughs> This show specifically, on, oops, I, this show specifically let, uh, uh, had the actors and characters being aware of the camera at moments because they were playing an online video game. But we also had scenes in which they weren't talking to each other on camera. These two actors are in completely two different spaces, but they're looking at each other and they're talking to each other because we staged eyeline. That was part of the blocking that we did. Uh, we had set design in which both actors had a piece of uh, prop that was on their wall um, and we just lined it up so that they were looking to each other. So this was them in a cafe scene. This is three actors having a, a three hand scene in which they were all talking to each other. They would move. Sometimes they'd be in frame. Sometimes they'd leave frame. But they, because of the staging that we did and the actors are entirely memorized, they would follow the other actors in the space. Using their online, they told us how the rest of the other people in the space were sharing. Um, none of these floor plans actually matched up but this is how they shared space together. Um, eventually in this play, that, uh, <laughs> which was written 10 years ago, uh, it goes into the world of Warcraft. Now, normally this is done in person um, and actors are wearing costumes and things like that. We actually decided to film this show, uh, film scenes from the video game and then have the actors voice over it live. So they voiced over it and then they brought their video on and they were interacting and responding to what they were seeing in the video game footage. This is specific to this show, uh, but I think many shows can translate online without having to have this video game online component. Uh, uh, I directed a reading uh, just a couple of weeks ago for Playground uh, called Abominable. There was no talk of tech in that play, but this was the reading. We had eight hours of rehearsal and it was a 90 minute play, but we used virtual backgrounds to create shared space again between actors. So we staged uh, the actual screen lineup. So the actors were next to each other and it seemed like they had a very shared space because the virtual background lined up with each other. The actors would then talk to each other, literally talking to empty space, but they would be sharing space. Um, 
couple of things I just want to talk, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? So when it comes to tech, Generation X and Millennials, they've got it in their hands, they're using it, they're consuming it. This is an audience that theater wants and needs to get. When it comes though to racial demographics, uh, whites and Asians have more access to tech and technology and tech literacy than Black and Hispanics uh, and Latinx folks. I wanna make sure that we are aware of this uh, because that's something that we have to work on with talking to tech industries about how we get that tech and that literacy into those people's hands. That being said, that difference of access to tech is pales in comparison to the access or the welcomingness of our space right now. Uh, this is Broadway 2006. As you can see, the demographic of white population to actually attendees in the audience, uh, 2016, sorry, is vastly large. So while we eventually still have to work on getting tech into the hands of those other demographics, there's a large audience there that has not experienced theater and has not felt welcome in the theater that we can now create through live video theater. Um, just a couple of quick technique tips that I want to talk about. Uh, basically, theater, in my opinion, uses reality and limitation to activate audiences' imagination. Whereas the difference is film. Commercial film takes our imagination, breaks limitations, and mimics it into reality. When we're watching a film, we're not activating our imagination as much as we are when we're watching theater. Theater, this hybrid form allows that activated imagination to go because it's all happening live. Um, Here's some really quick things. When you're thinking about live theater work, actor blocking, camera blocking, stage blocking, all those things can move. The camera can move, the screens can move, and the actors can move. When you're talking about that kind of blocking, stage direction shift where the cameras shift. Stage down follows the camera because the audience is shifting. But zoom directions like zoom up, down, right, and left, Follow the parallel field of the camera. Use post-it notes and spike tapes. That has how we got the actors to place and mark down where their devices, camera devices would be, where they walk in and out of frame, or they could put a post-it note on the wall and know that's that character that they're talking to at this moment and that that eye line is consistent. Also start learning basic film language and knowledge. Camera blocking, what is a pan, tilt, dolly, crane? Learn the 180 degree rule. Camera on one side, actors on the other. Um, this is just a start of the information that I have and gathered. Um, this is some of my information. Perseverance Theater has hired me to teach a live video theater workshop, which will be happening June 15th and 19th. A couple of other theaters company have asked me to consult with them, uh, which I'm doing. Also, Howron article will be coming out talking about this, and ACT is committed to it doing an encore performance out of In Love and Warcraft that's to be uh, determined. Um, so there's so much more I'd love to share, but I think I'm at time. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for being such a resource and actually uh, being generous in how you're working. So the information is shared because there are a lot of people along the continuum who are just starting to get into this work. So really practical things too. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go the long distance and visit our friends at Honolulu Theater for Youth. Um, so Eric and Moses and Reiko, I think you're up, right? Yeah, thank you so much. Great, Josh, if you want to uh, just go ahead and start with the slides and then we'll, we'll just jump in as we go. All right, here we go. Aloha mai kako and mahoa hana kayaka. Good morning, good afternoon, good healing to all of you who are listening and thank you for having us. Mahalo, Moses. We are a diverse, multi-ethnic, multicultural ensemble of artists and educators that has been serving Hawaii's families for 65 years. Yeah, so in response to the COVID-19, we were lucky enough to partner with two different organizations. One is uh, a local uh, media company called N NMG Network. And then our television station, our largest television conglomerate, which is the CBS NBC affiliate, um, Hawaii News Now, and we quickly created uh, our own digital production company out of those three entities, and we built the highway, which, next slide, slide please. And what is the highway? The highway is a 30-minute television show that was shot on our phones in our houses that was created to bring the magic of H2I stage productions right into the living rooms of our families that were stuck at home. And the idea really uh, was generated from our board of directors. Uh, we had a meeting when all this was going down and the board challenged us to find new ways to serve our mission in our community. And um, we decided, uh, 
somewhat irresponsibly at first, uh, but to keep our entire ensemble on payroll. And uh, we sort of gambled the farm and rolled everyone over into uh, producing TV uh, very, very quickly. So next slide, please. <laughs> okay, another show remained true to its name, The Highway. And for all eight episodes, we kept it, uh, kept the focus on the people and the stories of Hawaii, as you can see, exemplified in this picture of this beautiful Hawaiian woman. That's me, if you can't tell. Life in Hawaii is very, um, it's, it's very, it's unlike living anywhere else in the world. And um, the experience that we have here in Hawaii, Hawaii are very, very unique. Next slide. So we knew that we needed to tell the COVID story from a child's perspective and it, about what the families in Hawaii and around the globe were experiencing together in an unprecedented way. So episodes included everything from social distancing and fear to new ways families were finding to celebrate special days like birthdays. Next slide, please. Next. Great. So, so one of the things um, that I've really been thinking about in this moment is that what are the new stories that we need to teach this next generation? And I think that um, so often, and I'm so guilty of this, you know, a lone hero battling against evil in the world is such a dramatic idea uh, that we go to. But I think when we're facing something like climate change or uh, the COVID crisis is such a direct example, I think that the stories that are, might be most useful might not be epic battles of good versus evil, but rather many people making small changes and finding balance and seeing hope in, in a community effort. Um, and so that's what we tried to focus on. Next slide, please. Now again, we had eight episodes and in each episode we had, we had did a minimum of seven segments or stories. So if you're doing the math, that's about 60 stories that we were able to include. And in those we made sure we, we had it was an opportunity to um, to tell some very diverse range of a diverse range of stories and include some really diverse characters, especially um, for a uh, um, audience of young uh, a TYA, TYA audience. And so we were able to challenge them with all these these stories that we included. Next slide. Okay, so the results are that um, we're a company that we travel to uh, five different islands every single year uh, by plane, <laughs> and we're really dedicated to, to reaching a, 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 our whole population here uh, across the Hawaiian Islands. We are really proud to reach 120,000 people a year uh, with our theater work. So you can imagine how shocked we were when we found that in our first three weeks on television, we reached 176,000 viewers. Um, uh, and those, that was just for the first three episodes. So we're gonna blow our entire audience size out of the water um, <laughs> in a time where we can't uh, actually do theater. And I think that um, the, the skills we're learning to work across different mediums and explore different possibilities are just beginning. We're, we're talking about other ways of using digital content and using, I think our piece of this story is using an ensemble of theater artists and designers in a new entirely different way um, that they can switch back and forth. So our fundraiser is gonna be broadcast on, on primetime television uh, this year. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and funders will get uh, content and commercials on that uh, TV platform. And I think that there are um, three key elements that allowed us to pull off this transformation and we'll go through those really quickly. Next slide. Um, the first is uh, the efforts of the company. Now, HDY has always had a really strong ensemble that's sort of a standard at HDY. And so many of us have actually been working together for years. And so that means we know how we, we work where each other works. And so when we were challenged with creating content and new work from our own homes, we already had a, way, a, a, a system of working together that, that, that did translate to having to communicate through emails and texts and whatnot. And so we we're able to create some, some, some difficult things in, in our remote situations. Next slide. Uh, we're also dedicated to producing new work. So about 95, 90 to 95% of our work is original. About half of that is devised. And I think by supporting this full-time ensemble of artists, 
um, uh, that, that had already done so much devised theater and devised work, devising television or other medium is, uh, is completely a responsible ask uh, to make of them. Next slide. And third is that we're so very, very lucky to have invested in longstanding relationships with community partners like the Department of Health, and many others that span governmental and public and private sectors too. Next slide. Hey, we have a picture here of Kiyoki, one of our main puppet characters looking at the moon, wondering what's gonna happen next. So if next for us is we're gonna um, continue to uh, use this, this new way of working in whatever we do and however we, however we move forward in the future. We know this is going to be a part of it and we've already committed to and have started on um, nine more episodes that are going to start playing um, sometime in the fall. Next slide. And we would love to share the highway with all of you. So if you and your families want to jump on the highway, you can go to um, www.htyweb.org or to get in touch with us because we would love to be a resource for all of you. Mahalo for your time. It's been such an honor to speak with you today. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, my brain is just full of all of this amazing work. You all just thank you for sharing that. And I know that there um, are a lot of you all uh, conceivably with questions. I've been looking at the chat. Uh, I know that we've got some questions on YouTube. So we'll just spend uh, a couple minutes maybe taking some questions. And I know uh, my friends on the TCG team are scanning through um, looking for some questions to pull out. And so uh, if you've got a question, enter it into the chat. Uh, that would be the easiest way for us right now. Later on, after we do the breakouts, we'll be able to do some race hands functions and hear y'all verbally. Uh, but maybe um, if you have a question now, enter it into the chat. Uh, I know one of the things folks wanted to know about was uh, the PowerPoints and the websites that you all shared, um, just massive amount of information. Uh, so what I'll do uh, after this in ch is check in with all of the groups that have presented uh, and make sure that we can get uh, some resource um, documents together and uh, check with them to make sure that what, you know, what they want to share is something that, um, that we're honoring. Uh, and we will put that on Mighty Networks. Uh, it may not happen until later today or tonight, but that is our promise to you. Um, so I think um, my friend Aaron from TCG is scanning some of the questions for chat, or if uh, there's anyone else on the TCG team that has got some questions um, that you can pull out for our, our friends. Uh, I think we're good on YouTube. Um, are there some questions on the chat uh, that any of the TCG team wants to, to pull out? Because otherwise, you know, you'll be able to be in breakout sessions too, and I think there'll be some of this that'll come out in conversation. Uh, I do have one question. This is Michael from TCG. Um, so other than Zoom, Skype, et cetera, what software are you using to put your materials together? And I think that's probably um, for anyone that presented, uh, you can unmute yourselves, presenters. Sorry, could you pr uh, repeat the question? I didn't catch part of it. Uh, what other uh, materials? Sure. Uh, other than Zoom, Skype, et cetera, what software are you using to put your materials together? So we primarily use Zoom that gets transmitted to Facebook Live, but for our Playfest, which we had to postpone, um, or we chose to postpone, we, we, we were starting to use OBS, which is open broadcasting software, something like that. And someone might correct me. And OBS gives you a little bit more, um, uh, it's a free, I think, platform and it gives you a little bit more flexibility and branding and, and, um, and adding sound and title pages and all that. Mm -hmm. We use uh, Live Lab, as I mentioned, uh, which is now available. Um, so we'll, we can share those uh, those links, and um, and then we use that in tandem with OBS. So Live Lab is a video conferencing aspect, 
uh, like Zoom, uh, but then for streaming, then we use uh, a version of OBS called Streamlabs OBS, uh, which is also open source and free. Live Lab is open source and free as well. Uh, and that's how you can then transmit it to broadcast it to wherever you want, YouTube or Facebook or HowlRound. Anyone else from the presenting team wanna join in on that? Otherwise, maybe we'll shift to another question. Um, I know there are a lot of format platforms people can use, including Twitch. Um, I think Twitch is one that has built in interactive components um, so that you can have like live chats going on, people cheer it on, and you actually see that in the video. Um, we made sure that when we did our show, we had the live chat functioning, which helped the audience get a sense of collective laughter, sadness, um, and, he, uh, and just there was that point where the actors were creating hashtags Team Ryan, Team Raul, of which person they wanted that a main actress to be to fall in love with. It was really fun. Um, and there is a point where like the whole audience got silent and I thought we lost them. Um, but then some people were like, I just, I can't say anything right now. I'm so invested. And other people chimed in, they're like, I can't talk this, what's gonna happen? So it was creating a digital space again, I think is some, one of the things to think about. We cool. use um, Zoom Go ahead. to say that you can live hack it in, in a way, in a fashion that is, is useful to you. One of the things that's super important about theater and the idea of live theater and um, the question that starts this is what is, you know, what is theater? To me, um, creating an, a possibility of live interaction for the audience and for the audience to hear each other and see each other and feel each other is important. And I think that um, we've, I've sent out the charge <laughs> to people to say, we've got to create a new platform actually for theater artists so that we can maintain a sense of um, liveness and interaction that Zoom allows, but also um, a space that can be more heavily designed, you know, like we're dealing with with OBS. So come on. <laughs> I don't like to say, Thank I'd you. also like to say that um, uh, I am absolutely all about the live experience. And I also found that when my students, when many of them went to move to creating websites, that that sense of one audience member in relationship to the project um, uh, becomes also a really interesting rabbit hole to fall down. Uh, one audience member in relationship to a narrative that is then exploded into a web format. So I think I would, uh, it's a different kind of performance, but remains a performance and a platform nonetheless. I'm going to shift over to Aaron because I think there are a couple questions. So Aaron, do you want to pull one out? Sure. Um, we had this question come up a couple of times uh, for Peter. How did you ensure the camera alignment was as you wanted it on Zoom? And there was a bit of a follow up question if, if you had, um, if you wrote a guide, if something like that was available. Um, so, uh, there's a HowlRound article that's going to be coming out probably within the next week or so. It was going to come out this week, but um, I talked to them. And they responded about putting a pause on it with everything that's going on the, with the civil unrest that's happening right now in our country. And I thought that was important to give that attention. Um, but when that comes out, it, a lot of that has a few of that information. It's mostly about why live video, video theater is valid. I think what Amelia said right now is that there are a lot of criticisms of this format or that theater, that digital theater is something that's worthy, but it is. Uh, and not only is it worthy, it's its its own art. It's not in-person, live in-person theater. It's not film. It's its own hybrid thing. Um, and there's money to be made on it. There are theater companies that are already selling tickets through this experience, so it can be commodified, and it can re-stimulate our economy. It can create jobs for our field. And so, um, sorry, that's just a whole tangent of why that article is written. Um, but uh, I am teaching these workshops in which I will be uh, giving some more of that information. Um, back to, uh, as far as specifically the iLine site, so Zoom does, uh, Zoom specifically, and a lot of platforms do, have some kind of a algorithm to how screens get laid out, and this is what I call screen blocking. 
basically if you remove yourself from the zoom video everyone else is in order from left to right up to down so if you as an actor will never see what the audience sees because you will always be the second person mm -hmm. in the screen but once you remove yourself that order is consistent for everyone else so it matters when you bring audiences in or when you bring videos on when you bring them off that lines up who is standing next to who so that is where us uh, screen blocking comes in. Um, that's kind of a general conversation about that. I go into detail more. Okay, cool. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think Aaron or um, other folks on the TCG team, maybe we'll take uh, another question and then we are gonna take a break, a pause. Uh, yeah, this is one that was boosted by a couple people. Um, is there any way for recordings of Zoom events to be viewed with the chat streaming alongside it at the same time as it did when the real event was happening? The chat is such an important feature and so much information is shared there. Or maybe that's just a feature of the live event that can't be viewed after the fact. Um, I can answer that question. So on Facebook, um, the, the chat happens in conjunction in, the, in real time with the, with the, with the event. But once Facebook Live will record your event, and for example, all our events live on, on, on our Facebook page. And when you view it in recording, you can watch the chat also in real time. Or you can watch it all at once. You can say real time, all comments, most relevant comments. And so the answer is yes, you can record Zoom events. And then if you, at least for Facebook, I don't know about, I think on Twitch you can also. Um, and Peter may know more about that, but at least on Facebook, on Facebook, you can watch a recording and experience it in the same way that someone does live in the chat. Cool. Anyone else on the panelist team want to weigh in on that? Okay. Um, well, we're going to take a, a five minute break. Uh, because I think, you know, being in front of a screen for any length of time gets taxing. Um, so uh, we'll take a break in a moment. But for a moment, before we do that, uh, I actually would love to bring something else into the space right now. Uh, that George, George Floyd's family and his brother in particular, Terrence Floyd, uh, was doing a memorial that is happening kind of in real time now where he was speaking and then folks in Brooklyn were gonna walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. So I just wanted to take a, a moment before we go into our break to do just a moment of quiet and trying to send out positive energy to um, the family. So um, I'll stop. All right, thank you folks for that. Um, so we're gonna take five. Uh, Josh, I'm not sure if we have a timer, uh, but we'll take five. Then when we come back, uh, we'll be able to go into breakout groups and talk uh, more you know, in detail uh, and wherever the conversation goes for you all. I don't wanna hold that too tight, uh, but we are going to be um, spreading our panelists amongst the different breakout groups. I don't know how many breakouts we're gonna have. We'll be in the breakouts for about 20 minutes or so, then we'll come back as a group, talk some more, and then we'll see where we are. Y'all good? All right. Thank you, five. I'm at 157 Eastern.
Hey friends, it's that time. Uh, I know folks are like making their way. Um, so I am just scanning. Yeah, we've got a good critical mass of folks. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our Zoom God, Josh. And uh, Josh, you wanna talk us through going into breakouts? Hi everyone. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with breakout rooms on Zoom at this point, um, but I'm going to open them in a minute and then you should see a prompt on your screen to join. Or if you don't see that prompt, um, then just go to the bottom of your screen and search for the breakout room icon. It's not there yet, but it will be there now. So just let me know if you have any issues and feel free to return to the main room um, if you're not comfortable in your breakout. Uh, and Josh, I think what I forgot it I forgot to do was rephrase the prompt, so maybe we could send that to people. It's the um, the prompt is the definition of theater. Uh, theater is not a binary. Um, so what is it? Hey, Mila, can you hold? I'll just close all the rooms because I think sure, it's sure. better. Absolutely. Okay. Folks are returning. They're like unexpectedly returning. <laughs> <laughs> just give us 10 seconds, folks. So folks are rejoining because I just closed the rooms. All right, take it away, Amelia. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, so yeah, the prompt question is, um, if theater is not a binary, what is it? Put back. We got put back uh, into this room. Yeah, a lot of people got dumped back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'll go back in a breakout room in a second, because I think some folks were asking about the prompt question. So if the, the question is, if theater is not a binary, what is it? Okay. Pretty simple and wherever you're gonna take the conversation. Cool? Yeah, sorry folks. We just, we realized we didn't give you the prompt. So that's why we brought you back. Uh, so we're gonna send you back um, in a second. Whoa. All right, there you go. There we go, thank okay. you. Sorry about that. Okay. I think what always happens is people might be away from their screens. Um, and just so folks on YouTube know, um, we don't have a breakout room capability if you're following there. But we do still have room in the Zoom, in this, in this Zoom space, if you would like to join the Zoom, um, we can accommodate you in a breakout room here.
Amelia, I w I'm not sure if you're at your computer. Yeah, I was actually just ad answering a question in the chat. Great. That's what I was talking about. Yep. Sorry to not totally understand it, but there are four of us in the breakout room and none of us really knew what you meant, so. Okay, uh, sorry uh, that um, there's some conversation that feels that theater has to only be in a physical space, a theater building, um, and there are other folks that are saying theater can be uh, a different form in a virtual space, which is a binary and either or. or. So if it's not either or, what is, what is it? What can it be? Okay. That, we might, okay, that, that helps. How do I get back to my group? <laughs> you just don't see the, the breakout button at the bottom of your, I don't know how you're viewing, but usually you can see okay, that. Okay, join breakout room. I see it. Now. It was under more. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Hey Josh, I'm just looking at the list here to try to find your captioner. Um, I'm just not seeing anybody who had, usually our captioners put that they're a captioner within their name. Um, so I'm just not seeing them in their group. Um, I can transfer hosting back over to you if you think you remember their name at all. Or actually, um, Josh, would you mind doing something? You, Cause you could send a message to all of the groups, right? True. Because it's maybe the um, definition of the binary, what we just said that, um, uh, uh, sorry, I just went brain dead for a second. Um, by binary, we mean um, is theater, this theater can only happen in a theater, a physical theater building. If it doesn't happen in a physical theater building, it's not theater. So is the binary physical space versus digital space? Yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah. Or non. Uh, Sam, yeah, you can just go ahead and make me host. Yeah, I just broadcasted that message. But oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I've lost track of time. Where are we time-wise? About six minutes. Okay, cool.
Hey there, folks are making their way back. Welcome back. Great. Um, I realized actually I wasn't my most clear in sending you off uh, to your breakouts with those prompts. Uh, and so midway we um, put something in the chat, but nonetheless, I hope that you had um, conversations that kind of fueled some good ideas and um, questions were asked and thrown out, maybe not always answers, right? Uh, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, we'd love to be able to open the space up, not necessarily a report out in a formal way of you know what you talked about in your groups, uh, but thoughts, questions, resources, anything like that that came up. Um, we're going to do it two ways. And um, Josh, do you want to tell people about raise hands and because um, they could raise hands and then that'll automatically stack. And then um, we'll also take, keep, continue to take questions in the chat and also YouTube. Yep, just go ahead and use uh, the raise hand feature on Zoom or the chat on Zoom if you're more comfortable with that. And then um, if you can just comment on the chat on YouTube if you're watching that way. So I'll just hold and make space for some questions. And um, I'm going to be looking at my friends, other friends on the TCG team to see if things are popping up and if folks are raising their hands and we want to start a queue. I think we have a hand raised from Daniela. Go for it. Hi, everyone. I was in group two. Um, my name is Daniela and my group, we had Gavin, Amanda, Teresa, Yana, Jeremy, and Olga. Um, we talked a lot about what does it mean as artists, um, what we find sacred and deconstructing um, the idea of the art being sacred in four, in four walls um, and exploring outdoor performance as a different way of practicing theater. Um, some of us are educators and so we were also looking about um, different hierarchies and how um, maybe some theaters might um, create like, oh, I'm blanking out, I'm so nervous. Um, overall, we were just talking and listening and supporting each other and how to translate theater into different mediums, um, expanding, uh, expanding not just what we know from you know, writers, um, going again with Peter and collaborating with graphic designers uh, as our new frontier of theater is going into this new digital era. And, also, yeah, just that is all. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Great. TCG team, do you want to queue up? Who's next? Yes, we have Diana raising the, raising the hand. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, I think one of the things that it, we, uh, that I sort of re-remembered and that we emphasized in the group was the um, internet inequity and lack of access for a lot of our wider communities. That's really something that we're gonna have to take into account and, and figure out as we uh, continue to share out virtually. Absolutely right. Thank you. Um, next we have Jay with a hand raise. Hey y'all. I just wanted to share something that uh, I've been thinking about and we talked a, a bit about it in our group, which is the ways in which theater is in service of community. And if, if, we, if we maintain that that's what we use theater for, to reach, to change, et cetera, our community, then what are the ways in which we might be able to theatricalize service uh, outside of the walls of the theater, whether that be um, in terms of uh, getting people in terms of food justice. How do we maybe create a Zoom experience where we go to a grocery store with folks who maybe have a bad relationship with food or otherwise feel like they don't have access to good food that is nourishing and not a piece of 
plastic. <laughs> that maybe there's an actor where you could choose your adventure and go to uh, your kitchen and pull out the ingredients that you feel like you can make nothing with. And there's an actor completely dramatizing some cooking show and you end up with a beautiful meal that is nutritious for your family. Um, so looking at a lens of being in service to community and how do we theatricalize that and so that we're still creating theater, though we may not be inside. Absolutely, absolutely. We actually had a session earlier today uh, that was called um, Theater is What the Community Wants Us to Be. Uh, and there are folks exactly doing that. Uh, we had uh, Jack from Brooklyn that is a food distribution hub. Uh, we also had Target Margin on, uh, talking about a variety of their programs, but also the mass distribution that they did. They, you know, made a performative effort, basically delivering masks throughout. Uh, farm Arts Collective, which is literally a farm, um, and so uh, they uh, distribute food to the community, and they actually have started videotaping um, cooking shows to help people uh, 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 come up with ideas of, of how to cook what is in your food box. Uh, so there definitely are folks out there. Um, I would look at the list of the folks that were presenting there. That's a good start. Uh, and we'll try to generate notes out of this, is, uh, out of that earlier session as well. But there might be other folks on this call too that want to speak to that or any other topic. Great. Um, I'm kind of just going off the hand raises here. So we have Keith next. Yeah, so our group, we got a little uh, more literal about what the theater experience is and um, really focused more on the interactivity of it, the interaction of it, that the essence of theater is the direct communication between actor and audience, between performers and audience. And so working with these new mediums in a way that that interaction, that connection can happen is something that we didn't want to lose sight of as we were talking. Cool. Um, I know that uh, we're at 2.33 uh, Eastern um, and uh, there are still a few more questions. Our uh, conference team said that we could go another minute or two more. Uh, so whoever wants to stay, welcome to stay. If you need to run, cool. But maybe we'll just take one or uh, two more questions and go for about another five. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, so Josh or anybody scanning the chat for questions? Um, I think we have um, Andre. The... I, I think that it's important to highlight how this platform um, makes us more available to communities that otherwise wouldn't be able to buy a ticket to our theaters. I think that it's really important to like be able to, uh, even though like we were talking in our group, like changing our mindset, but like we are hitting more people and like everyone was talking about it. Every uh, Everyone that talked earlier was talking about how people suddenly have more views than in their whole year. And I think that's part of it. We're able to get to communities that we wouldn't be able, that aren't available to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just uh, I, hopefully every theater and every theater maker is thinking about the relationship to community and audiences, not as being transactional, but uh, of building relationships over time that you can't expect to do uh, one show, somebody comes and then, you know, you call them up like another month or two again to come to another show, it's transactional versus how, what is, where's the mutual benefit in that relationship, not a one-way street. And uh, mm -hmm. that's something that TCG through our audience revolution program has been working on. And I know I'm scanning through a lot of y'all are already really doing that quite well. Uh, another question or two, and then we might have to wind down folks. Um, I see uh, Francine in the queue. Thanks. This is great, and our group was great, and we were really excited about the fact that all of these new discoveries 
create so much access for people who haven't had it before. And I, I too want to remind people about advocating for broadband. I live in a place where there's not a lot of access. But my question, so this raises a question about when to monetize and when not to monetize. I did uh, do a Mutini. I loved the uh, what Theater Mew is doing. And they had, I, I know when I did that, I donated money. They asked for donations. And I'm wondering if that's what other groups are doing or if they're charging a certain amount and how they're doing that. I know that probably can't be answered now, but it is something on my mind. But I can I can answer really quick if that's okay. So we with with LDA we actually did um, we had ticket sales and we had a scale from anywhere from eleven dollars to forty dollars if you bought a package. So um, you know it was a big question mark for us when we first started. Obviously during COVID and and you know everybody going through hard, uh, financial hardships, but um, what we what we did find is, you know, although one 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 ticket is a, a ten minute experience, is that people wanted to have a longer experience. Um, so that thir that thirty dollar or forty dollar ticket gave you that. And we also, um, the way that the show was structured, you could come back multiple times. So if I bought one ticket for eleven dollars, I can come back again and see another show and go to another city. So um, I, I do want to say that it did work, and 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 people people did buy tickets. And people bought the forty dollars tickets; those sold out first. Yep. Mm -hmm. People wanted an optimal experience. If they were going to sit down and actually watch something online, they wanted to optimize their experience. Well, what I appreciated, Pamela, in um, long distance affair was that you could choose your own adventure. You could go to one city, and so that was an amount. You could go to more cities; it was a little more money. So there were options for people to choose according to budget too. In that way. Correct. We talked to a, um, a pricing specialist that came in and talked to the National New Play Network, and uh, they did a seminar on it, which I'll see if we can get them to share. But uh, what was really helpful is them talking about that people are putting multiple price points in that start anywhere from 5, 10, 15, 25, 50, with really no other benefit at the, except that people choose their price point, and actually people chose higher price points. Um, so they said there's no reason to not do it because people do select the higher price points. Also, Francie, yeah. we've been able to leverage some of our programming for sponsorships, mm -hmm. for corporate sponsorships. So um, for the George Takei episode, obviously, but also for our Play Fest, we had a corporate sponsor. And I would also... Were, oh. Go ahead, Dad. I'm, gonna say, so I, I'm with Arts Consulting Group, in addition to being a stage director. We were actually going to do a session about this on Tuesday, which had to be moved, obviously, because of all the changes in the world. Um, but the big takeaway is that there's more and more theaters experimenting with it. And basically, they're not having any trouble selling, again, 10, 10 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollar tickets. Um, and the other interesting point about it is that a lot of those tickets they're selling to people who don't already participate with their organization. So it's people who would never have come in person, not only seeing what they're putting online, but paying for it. So there's a lot of uh, lead out there. Obviously, the flip side is even people who've been charging for online content for a long time are giving it for free right now in a lot of cases because it's a crisis moment. But that's, that's, that's what's happening out there. Thank you, Douglas. Um, I think we're going to have to start to wind down, folks, because uh, there are other sessions happening uh, later and want to make sure that you all are taking time for breaks and the TCG team, too, we need some breaks. Um, this has been fabulous. Uh, my promise to you all is to gather the information, the resources we have, and uh, it'll get posted probably on Mighty Networks. Uh, and like I said, give us a little grace period. It may not happen right after we close this, but um, certainly between now and the end of the conference, maybe I'll say that. Uh, I wanted to give a big shout out to uh, all the groups that presented and inspired us. So thank you, thank you. Um, a big shout out to the TCG team uh, that was frantically running the back end and the chat and YouTube and HowlRound and our Zoom god, Josh and Sam. I know hey. there are probably other folks. A big shout out. We couldn't really do this without y'all. So uh, to be continued. This is not the end of this conversation, right? Ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much. All the best. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Peter, you rock. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michael Francis. <laughs> Oh, no one was. <laughs>